I would like to welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. It is part of an ongoing series developed as part of an FDA-funded project called A Targeted Learning Framework for Causal Effect Estimation Using Real-World Data. The focus is on topics in targeted learning, causal inference, and machine learning. The title of today's webinar is Practical Issues of Targeted Learning and is presented by Dr. David Benkesser, Assistant Professor in the Department of Biostatistics and Bioinformatics at Emory University's Rollins School of Public Health. Dr. Benkesser received his PhD in Biostatistics from the University of Washington and completed a postdoctoral fellowship at University of California at Berkeley. His research focuses on understanding whether and how machine learning methodology can be used to draw causal inference. His methodology has been applied in the analysis of preventive vaccines to better understand causal mechanisms of, mechanisms of protection, in studies of HIV prevention using social media-based mobile phone applications, and other emerging areas of public health need. David, we'd like to thank you for joining us today. The talk today, I think, is, is going to be very sort of practically oriented. Um, I, I think there's maybe one equation in the whole talk. Um, just really kind of wanted to get my perspective on how sort of how I got into targeted learning. I know a lot of the key concepts have been covered in the previous talks in this series, so I won't spend a lot of time there. But then I want to just sort of go through some examples uh, in my own recent work of, of sort of how this stuff is being used in practice, at least in my group, the sorts of problems that we think about and address, how we address them when we're actually implementing these things in practice. And then a few at the end, just a few issues. Uh, sort of looking towards the future of ways we can do a better job, I think, going forward implementing these type of analyses. So the first section is why targeted learning. And Susan, you can flip to the next slide. So I can give you my life story of how I arrived uh, in the targeted learning world. So I spent uh, the first few years as a PhD student working on an observational cohort studies. And it was sort of very vanilla biostatistics. And by that, I mean sort of there was an existing cohort and sort of the way that research progressed is that someone would come up with some exposure they were interested in, some outcome they were interested in. Um, and then the analysis plan would sort of write itself. Um, so what I mean by that is, you know, sort of you look at the outcome and if it's binary, well, the analysis calls for logistic regression. If it's a survival endpoint, then it calls for a Cox model, right? And so we kind of had these, you know, it's, almost an automated procedure, very boring as an analyst in some sense, to know, you say, look at the outcome, is it survival time? Great, we're gonna do a Cox model. And we're not gonna do just one Cox model. We're gonna first do a model that adjusts for age and sex and our exposure of interest. Then we're gonna maybe add in BMI to that model. And then we're gonna maybe add in some inflammatory markers. And you come up with this kind of laundry list of models. And that's sort of the way that, uh, that, that science progressed at that point. So the way it worked as an analyst is you'd, you'd write that kind of very vanilla statistical analysis plan. You'd fit the models, you'd make your table, right? And then you'd share it with your collaborators, right? And you could almost think of, of this process, like you could almost anticipate your collaborator's response to those results um, before you even sent the email, right? So I would email this table of all the model results and I would know, is, is, are there small p-values in that table? If so, they're gonna be happy with it. Right? Does the answer make sense? Does it line up with their a priori hypothesis? Then they're gonna be happy with it, right? But if not, well, then maybe we missed some important covariant, right? And so we need to go back to these models and say, well, what about adjusting for this? What about adjusting for this? And then every collaborator who's on the author list has their own pet confounder that they wanna include in the model. And this process kind of cycles through. And at some point you start looking for interactions and it's never really clear at what point, you know, you're done, right? Uh, but you can kind of bet that, that you're done when the p-values are small and the answer kind of lines up with what you're thinking. And as a statistician, it's very discouraging to work in a setting like that, or I was very discouraged because I was a graduate student, you're sort of sitting in class and learning, you know, all the no-nos of that process, right? Is that, you know, our, our inference should be pre-specified. We need to stick to uh, to an analysis plan that we that we write down ahead of ever looking at the data. Right. We need to adjust our inference for all this model checking that we're doing. And they're sort of not doing that. So the way that at least I tried to rationalize this so I could sleep at night, right, is you tell your collaborators, right, we're just doing an exploratory analysis. Right. So this is something exploratory. At the end of our paper, we're going to note all these limitations and we're going to say, 
you know, we need to do more confirmatory studies. Great. And your collaborators say, yes, of course, we're going to, you know, write this in an exploratory way and you don't have to worry about this and you can sleep easily at night. All right. But then when the paper comes out, of course, the, the title is in big bold print, like this exposure strongly related to outcome or this variable has strong effect modification with the outcome. Right. And, and then your depressing life as an observational data analysis continues along that track. So that's sort of um, where I was at when I started thinking about actually how to do research. Um, and Susan, if you'll advance to the next slide. What was sort of appealing about the targeted learning paradigm and this roadmap for, um, for, for drawing inference was it really addressed a lot of those, a lot of that unease that I had in that process of analyzing observational data. You know, to begin with, we're, we're talking about science up front, right? We're not looking at the outcome and asking, is it a survival time? Is it a binary endpoint? If so, I know exactly how I'm going to analyze these data, right? Instead, we're trying to have a collaborative discussion, right? What are we actually trying to answer here? What are the policy implications? What are the scientific implications, right? And trying to address our analysis towards actually answering those. That, that, that's already very appealing to me is that it's encouraging, encouraging constructive collaboration and scientific collaboration rather than this sort of iterative uh, kind of rote process of, of churning out these analyses. Uh, and the more of the, the, this, the idea of super learning, which has, I think, been discussed at length in this uh, series, right, is, is really giving everybody's model a place at the table, right? You're not in this position where every collaborator has their own pet model, right? And you're using some kind of arbitrary criterion to pick between them. And it's very uncomfortable as a statistician, right? Because we've already looked at the data. We've already fit these models. Our, our collaborators have already seen the p-values associated with these models, right? So it's, it's almost impossible, even with the best intention of, of intentions to remain completely objective. You know, when you're, when you're in a position like that. Uh, the, the idea of pre-specifying everything, right? Another strength of the super learner framework, right? So that, that's gonna lead to better uh, calibrated inference, more replicable inference, science that we can trust a bit more, right? And still at the end of the day, in spite of, you know, all of this adaptivity, right? There's strong theoretical justifications for what we're doing, right? So it kind of checks those, those boxes of everywhere and that, that process that I was uncomfortable with, sort of the, the, the automatic, not even thinking about science, just going and churning out these models. Uh, we're not doing that anymore, right? We're not picking models at random anymore, right? We have objective criteria that teaches us how to pick between these models, right? Everything's moving, all these discussions about modeling are moving ahead of the time that we ever look at data. And so that was kind of very appealing to me having come out of this world of observational data analysis where really, even though we're publishing papers and publishing papers in reasonably good journals, right? I still didn't really trust anything that we were doing. Okay. So that's kind of my own personal sob story about how I got into this, why I think this stuff is appealing. And now I think I'll move on to sort of more practical issues uh, and, and how I'm using this stuff in my own work today. So can advance to the next slide. And again, so I'm gonna talk about two papers um, and I picked these to sort of bring up some of the, because they sort of address some of the practical issues that I think you run into and the sorts of things that, that you need to think about when you're thinking about how to implement these, these methods in practice. So I'll just give a bit of background on these so we're not you know, just talking about statistics out of the blue. So this first paper uh, recently came out in Clinical Infectious Disease. It was a study of a multidrug resistant tuberculosis. And so just a little bit of epidemiology of multidrug resistant tuberculosis, it's really a growing public health crisis. And I didn't really, think too much about this until I started getting into the tuberculosis world. You know, living in the first world, TB is not something that, that we always hear a lot about. You know, the developed world has done a pretty good job of controlling TB, right? But in, in many countries, in particular former Soviet republics, uh, multidrug resistant TB and TB in general is a big problem, right? So, so MDR-TB or multidrug resistant TB, that's just tuberculosis that's resistant to, to first line drugs, okay? So when Somebody comes in, we culture the bacteria that they're infected with, and we check whether it's sensitive to uh, these first line drugs that are available. And if it's resistant, uh, we call that multidrug resistant uh, tuberculosis. And so we've kind of been using uh, the same suite of TB drugs, and there's many of them, but we've kind of been using that same suite for a very long time. Uh, and it's only been recently that we've started to bring drugs to market that have been sort of targeted directly at this MDR TB. So in particular, bedaclin and delaminid are two sort of newly approved drug. So bedaclin is the first anti-TB drug that's, uh, that was approved by the FDA in over 50 years. Uh, and delaminid has uh, received recently received conditional approval for use by the European Medical Agency. So two new therapeutics that are 
that are exciting for potentially controlling MDR-TB. And there's some limited guidance out there for how they should be assigned from WHO, but there's really a kind of a dearth of clinical data about outcomes related to these. And they were never evaluated head to head in a clinical trial. Uh, so that's really what we were after here is trying to use some observational data to try to inform patient care about, about assigning these new drugs in sort of a in the field context, right? Outside the confines of, of a typical randomized trial. So this study was conducted in the country of Georgia, right, which actually has one of the highest rates of MDR-TB in the world. So it was a small observational study, about 100 patients with MDR-TB uh, were followed for, I think, up to two years. And each of these patients was receiving uh, a treatment combination that either included bedactylin or delaminid, these two new therapeutic drugs. Uh, so the analyses I'm going to talk about are going to basically be asking, can we kind of discern what the effect of, of receiving a bedactylin-based or delaminid-based therapy is uh, on patient outcomes? In particular, we're going to focus on the sputum culture conversion uh, as, as the endpoint, uh, which is really just saying if we if we try to culture for the bug uh, using biological samples from you, are we able to detect uh, detect the bug in you? And so if you're interested in reading more details about the paper, that uh, DOI number there is actually a hyperlink to, to the paper itself. Okay, so that's the first topic, the first the study we're going to talk about. And Susan, you can go to the next slide. And this is the second one. So related, it's another TB study. Uh, and, but here we're looking at very different exposure, right? Not a sort of therapeutic, but rather uh, kind of environmental exposure, schistosomiasis. So if you're not familiar with schistosomiasis, um, it's a very nasty intestinal parasite. Um, it's it's an intestinal worm. It affects over 240 million people every year and almost 25% of Sub-Saharan Africa. Right? So it's responsible for substantial morbidity and mortality. Right? In the literature, there's kind of existing data to show that uh, schistosomiasis and other worm infections uh, impair immune responses against TB. So we know they're affecting the immunity, the same immune responses that are used to protect you against TB, but there's really not a lot of good data out there about their effect on actual TB outcomes. And in particular, almost no data out there on, about their association or effects uh, with latent TB. And right? so, so TB is a bug you can have an active infection or more often we see that TB sort of just sits latently uh, in infected individuals uh, for many years. Okay, so we're really interested in understanding here, does schistosomiasis have an impact? Is it associated with these kind of uh, levels of, of TB infection and disease. Uh, and beyond that, we're sort of interested in um, understanding the role that HIV plays in, in, in uh, potentially uh, modifying that relationship. So we know HIV is a, is a risk, factor, risk factor for TB. Uh, it's implicated in the pathogenesis of schistosomiasis. Uh, and there's really no data out there that have examined this association in the presence of HIV status. Uh, so those are the questions we're interested in here. So there's kind of an overall question here, right? Is there an association with schistosomiasis? And then there's also an effect modification question. And so I sort of wanted to bring up these two examples. In the first one, we'll see the real kind of issues that we were thinking about when addressing these problems with targeted learning for the multi-drug resistant tuberculosis problem. We'll see that's really the sample size. It was a pretty small study. And so the big questions we had there are, well, is it safe to sort of use this stuff in small samples? And in this question, uh, effect modification for, for the Schisto study, effect modification is a big question. So I wanted to kind of get into the issues of when you're asking effect modification questions, how does that shift your perspective in thinking about how to actually implement targeted learning? Okay, so um, I think we'll just kind of move on to the next section. Right, so this, this section is all about sort of choosing a library. Right, so how do we decide what goes into a super learner library when we're implementing uh, a targeted learning type analysis? Right, and, and what are the relevant considerations? And again, so I wanted to kind of talk about this in the context of those two studies because I think it kind of brings up uh, some important considerations. So the first point I want to make here is that when we talk about doing targeted learning using super learning, uh, and I often like to emphasize that this is fully pre-specified. Right. I started talking about the sort of iterative model building and checking and refitting and adding variables in and so forth that I was very uncomfortable with. And then I argue that super learning is actually a pretty nice solution to that, right? Because it puts all of that modeling up front, right? We can fully pre-specify the analysis. Okay, but I think oftentimes when people hear about machine learning and artificial intelligence, they think that's sort of an automated black box process, right? Kind of devoid of human input. 
right? You get a data set, you churn it through your black box and out pops an answer without ever having a human thought go into the analysis. And I just like to, to, to first and foremost say that, that that's not how I think that this stuff should be used in practice. Right? Pre-specification of analysis does not mean a fully automated analysis that doesn't require any human input. Indeed, I think we're not really at the point with our AI technology and machine learning technology. We're trying to do something that that achieves that level of automation is necessarily a good idea, right? We need to still draw for human scientific expertise, right? We need to let the, the experts in the scientific context areas inform how we construct our super learner library, right? So the first point I just want to make about what, what goes into the process of choosing a super learner library, what goes in the process of uh, implementing these targeted learning? Well, the first part is collaboration with scientists, right? We need to sit down with, with the real experts uh, and scientists in these areas and talk to them about what variables are important, what's their past experience modeling these variables been, right? Where should we be looking out for kind of idiosyncrasies of the data, right? And that has to happen sort of right off the bat. Okay, so that's the first point. And then I think if you move on to the next slide, Right, so the first step really, I would say, as, as we engage in this conversation, right, is how do you pick which variables to include in analysis, right? Choosing your covariates to include, choosing the potential confounders, effect modifiers, so forth. So here's sort of an oversimplification of, of you know, causal graphs, sort of labeling different variables that might appear in a DAG in a rather simple setting, right, where there's just a point treatment uh, outcome measured at one time. And sort of some, some language that I think anyone who's read the causal uh, literature is familiar with, but just as sort of a reminder, uh, there's certain, we're gonna define variables based on how they relate to other variables. So in particular, we're really after trying to identify confounders, right? That's the first thing I think that we should care about when we're engaging with our collaborators, we're asking these questions, right? What's going into a doctor's decision to prescribe bedaclin versus delaminate, right? What are in those WHO guidelines Right, that the doctors are supposed to be consulting to decide who gets what treatment, right? And then thinking about are those same factors that are influencing their decision, are they putatively related to how somebody uh, does under treatment? Are they putatively related to the outcome? Right? If so, that that's, that's potentially a confounder, right? So that's that green box at the bottom, of course, classic definition of confounder. Uh, also, we're interested in variables only related to the outcome. And I'm, I'm calling those precision variables here. Right? And those are variables not necessarily confounding the relationship. They could be ignored, but there's often still some benefit to trying to identify those variables and make sure that we uh, include them. So that's really uh, gaining us precision, right? It's improving our, the variance of our estimators uh, as opposed to confounders, which is gonna improve the bias, right? And then everything else in red, they're kind of the, the things to be aware of, right? Instrumental variables, we sort of wanna be aware of uh, their existence. Um, those are things that influence only the treatment Right, but not related to the outcome. Uh, and there are in particular things that can cause sorts of uh, issues uh, when, when using certain estimators of causal effects. Uh, and then there's of course collider bias, which I'll just mention here. Uh, more often, I believe that's coming in from kind of the design of the study and who gets sampled in the study. Uh, and if you wanna read a bit more about that, when I was preparing this talk, I found a real cute piece by uh, Steve Cole from UNC a couple of years ago in International Journal of Epidemiology that provides some nice sort of background information on collider bias and, and why it's something to worry about. Okay, so I think, again, this is kind of a way oversimplification of causal uh, graphs, a whole literature out there on this, but just to bring it up to say that this, to me, when you're thinking about implementing a target learning analysis in practice, this is stage one, right, is talking about what's, what's the DAG, which variables are we gonna end up trying to adjust for, which ones do we wanna avoid, and are there any really pitfalls sort of for trying to draw causal inference to begin with? Right, so learning, I would say learning the language of causal graphs is definitely worthwhile for engaging in these sorts of discussions uh, with collaborators. Okay, so we can go to the next slide. So here's, it looks like some, some odd formatting on this slide, sorry about that. So this is kind of how that discussion played out in the example of the MDR uh, TB study, right? So as I said, there are WHO guidelines out there for how bedaclin versus laminate should be assigned. Uh, but just one look at the data tells you that nobody was following those guidelines, right? So, so you can you can very clearly see that doctors are kind of making their own treatment decisions uh, based on factors that we really don't understand. We can kind of try to ask the few that we have uh, access to, you know, what are you thinking about in these settings? Uh, but beyond that, we really kind of don't, we lack for information uh, 
uh, to decide how or to, to understand how doctors are assigning these treatments. So we came up with this sort of list of possible confounders based on this discussion. You can see the, the list here. If you work in TB, you'll see some, some familiar guys in there, uh, like HIV status, where the disease is in the body and so forth. Um, and then there was one possible precision variable that we identified, and that's sort of the number of effective drugs that a participant was on. And that's information that wouldn't have been available to a doctor at the time that they were assigning treatment because we have to basically culture the bug and see which drugs uh, are the, the bug is actually sensitive to before we uh, can understand how many of the drugs that we've given a patient are actually effective against their infection. All right, so that's again an, uh, uh, a variable that's, that's in, in no way could be a confounder, uh, but in some sense is still potentially interesting to bring into the adjustment set uh, because of the possibility for gaining precision. All right, you can head to the next slide. Okay, so as I said, the, the sort of big issue that I wanted to, uh, or, or the reason for bringing up this analysis in particular in the context of targeted learning was this limited sample size, right? So there's only 64 participants receiving a bedaclin based regimen, 31 with the laminate. And so the question I was asking myself is, are we at risk here if we try to be too aggressive, right? Is it, is it dangerous to include machine learning algorithms in a super learning library? Is it dangerous to do super learning in general, right? This is a pretty small sample size. We have great asymptotic theory that says, yes, everything's nice and optimal in large samples, but this is 100 participants, 30 in one treatment arm. So pretty small. And so we were thinking about how could we, you know, modify kind of the, the approach here, or should we modify the approach to kind of appropriately account for the sample size issue? Okay, so one way we thought that, that maybe you could do that, have an impact, uh, is adjusting the number of cross-validation folds. So remember sort of the more folds that you have in a cross-validation procedure, the larger your training sets are getting. Right? The validation sets are getting smaller, but the training sets are getting larger. So we thought maybe adding more folds here Right, would give you some more data to try to train these algorithms, right, and, and maybe lead to better stability of the resulting fits. Right, so we wanted to, to see, are we gonna do a better job by using uh, more cross-validation folds? Okay, so those are the big, big questions we were trying to address with this. This was a, a master thesis, a great student. She's now at NYU doing a PhD. This was her thesis. You can go to the next slide, Susan. So we set up sort of a simple, uh, it's like resampling based simulation. All right, so the idea here was we were sort of bootstrap sampling from the distribution of uh, the confounders and uh, the treatment. So just sampling with replacement from the observed data, but then just sort of randomly assigning everybody an outcome. Okay, so just kind of permuting outcomes, in which case um, we sort of know what the truth is. We're, we're generating a data set that looks like the real data set um, but where we actually know what, what the treatment uh, effect is that we should be estimating. And so that was our sort of rough way of approximating, trying to understand the behavior of these TMLEs in this uh, particular example. So we, we kind of built two different approaches here. The first was what I'll call our, our like safe TMLE, right? So this was just using very simple, very stable algorithms. Um, so things like logistic regression, we'll see a list in a second, but these are things like logistic regression or stepwise logistic regression, and where we're restricting to adjust for at most three covariates. Okay, so that was sort of the, the idea there is we're going to try to limit the number of covariates that enter in the model. We're not going to put any machine learning algorithms in the library. We're going to try to just keep things simple and stable. And then the second one said, okay, let's include all of those those straightforward algorithms too, but let's try to be a bit more aggressive, right? So let's include some machine learning algorithms. So we included uh, random forest boosting and polynomial multivariate adaptive regression splines, polymorphs. And then, so it kind of took the simple library and, and layered on top of that uh, more aggressive algorithms, right? And then there was a second question of how do cross the number of cross validation folds, whether and how that affects inference derived from, uh, from the TMLE procedure. So we consider super learners based on two, 10, and 20 cross-validation folds. You can head to the next slide. And so here's the results from that simulation. So what's being shown is basically the, the confidence interval coverage for the sort of counterfactual mean estimate uh, for bedaclin and for delaminate. So the treatment specific sort of rates of, of culture conversion in those two drug classes. 
And on the horizontal axis, we're showing the number of cross-validation folds uh, with the left pa panel uh, being the simple TMLE estimator and the right panel being the uh, more aggressive one. So what we found in this case is that the inference actually tended to be a little bit conservative, even for that TMLE that was using the complex library. So we're having confidence intervals that uh, overcover the truth, right? Or so if you flip that to a hypothesis testing setting, right, that would be hypothesis tests that have a actually smaller type one error rate than the nominal level of the test. Uh, and then secondly, we see that there's really wasn't a lot of impact of the number of cross-validation folds. Um, and we sort of did some other simulations based on synthetic data uh, that was designed to sort of mimic this. And, and these observations really kind of held uh, across the board here. So based on the results we saw from the simulation study, uh, we selected doing an analysis based on the more aggressive TMLE. So we thought, we, we felt pretty comfortable that we weren't really at risk here, of sort of overfitting too much, even in the small data set. Uh, and we picked 20 folds across validation. All right, and you can head to the next slide for results. So here's the sort of um, cumulative incidence curves, if you like. Uh, from this analysis. So on the horizontal axis, we're saying in a given week, what's the proportion of individuals in a given treatment regimen who have culture converted, right, who have cleared their infection? And then the orange color there is the bedaclin-based regimens and delaminid uh, is in the blue color. And then so our primary inference here was based on two time points that uh, are most cl clinically relevant. So at two months and at six months, and you can kind of see that, that as we move on and follow up the, the outcomes based on bedaclin, uh, tend to get a little bit better than the laminate. And even by six months, you see that there's evidence of a, a significant difference between those with, with bedaclin uh, achieving better outcomes. All right, so that was kind of in line with what was out there, the limited amount of information that was out there in the literature. So it was sort of nice that we were able to, to see that using our observational study as well. All right, so go to the next slide. Here's just quickly what the super learners looked like in that case. So on the left side, there's the super learner outcome model. And so you can read sort of descriptions of the algorithms there. So as I said, the, the first uh, four there are sort of the very stable, very basic restricting to three confounders in the model. And you see that indeed the super learner likes those models best, right? So the machine learning is seeming to be a little bit too aggressive, maybe doing a little bit of overfitting. But it's sort of nice that super learner is already picking that up in terms of cross-validated risk, right? And it's shifting weight towards the more stable algorithms. So again, it's a very kind of nice feature of doing these super learner-based analyses. At least in this case, we found that cross-validation was still protecting us from, from this overfitting, even in relatively small samples, uh, it seems. All right, so we can go to the next slide. Okay, so the key, key points. So I wanna emphasize that that the, I'm not recommending, you know, as, as a rote recommendation to always use targeted learning, always use super learning in very small samples, right? I'm, I'm really just saying in this setting where we were able to kind of take the time to develop simulation study, convince ourselves that this would work, it seems safe to use. So I would say in general, there's no finite sample guarantees. So as you're in, in these small samples, I think you really need to be evaluating things in a specific context, right? And things that are gonna influence that or the number of endpoints that you observe, the number of covariates that you're trying to adjust for, the particular algorithms that you're including in your library. So there's a lot of moving pieces here, right? So I do think if you have the, the time and ability, sort of calibrating these decisions using a treatment blinded or outcome blinded simulations is a good way to go, All right? So in this case, right, we, we were really trying to remain objective here. So uh, we asked our collaborator to withhold the, um, the actual outcomes, right? And just share with us you know, a, a shuffled version of those. And that was enough to sort of get our simulation off the ground, right? But, but not let us peek sort of at the results, right? So what we were doing there is sort of trying to maintain objectivity while we were making these hard modeling decisions. And this is something that we've started to implement a lot uh, in practice where we really, uh, the statisticians in charge of the analysis plan, right? We, we try to get a hold of the data set, but a data set where we're either simulating the outcome or we're dealing with a shuffled version of the real outcome. What that allows us to do is develop these simulation studies to, to examine performance. Uh, and it also allows us to just develop a robust code bank, right? Implementing these analyses, right? So there's, there's great software out there for this, but it still involves quite a, bit of, quite a bit of coding, right? And so what we like to do is try to get the data set ahead of time, 
remain blinded, but be able to use that blinded data set to be able to develop the code so that once we unblind ourselves, really it's just a push button analysis. So we're really moving towards that kind of fully pre-specified uh, approach. Okay, the final key point here, I think, is that sometimes I show results like this and people see that you know, the simple logistic regression model was doing best and they say, well, yeah, of course, you know, I, I, I know and trust logistic regression. Uh, why would I ever, you know, use machine learning? Look, it, it, it was the winner here. It's always going to be the winner. And I think that that's a bit too strong of a takeaway from this, right? Because for me, at least, I, I, I tend to be a bit more conservative, right? Before I approached this analysis, we really had no idea, right? Which variables were important here, how many of them would end up being important. There were a lot of unknowns and that's very clear talking to collaborators, right? Is what, you know, what's, what's influencing somebody's probability of, of culture converting? You ask five different doctors that they'll give you five different answers, right? There's not a general scientific consensus around there. So we really don't know what the best modeling strategy is going to be a priori. So for me, even though the simple logistic regression model is a winner, that's no problem uh, in my book. I think super learning was still worth the effort in the sense that we were able to kind of protect ourselves from sort of unanticipated scenarios, right? Where there were maybe strong interactions or some nonlinear, uh, nonlinearities present that we would have otherwise missed. So, that's, that's the takeaway here is that, that often you will see simple models uh, being the winner, but I don't think that that means that, that it's, it's never worth the effort to go through uh, a lot of kind of thought in developing a super learner library. Okay, so we can head to next slide. Moving on to that schistosomiasis example. Okay, so this was a setting where really, again, and, and this, this happens very often, as we started engaging with my collaborators who work on schisto and on tuberculosis and asking them, you know, what, what could be confounders, what could be precision variables, and they kind of throw their hands up and they say, we, we have no idea, right? What if affects the probability of somebody getting schisto, right? We have some ideas, but they vary wildly depending on the region, uh, depending on the, the local cultures. And then we only have a basic understanding of kind of the immunology of the pathways that would go between a schisto infection and a tuberculosis disease endpoint. So at the end of the day, we sort of just end up saying, okay, well, what did you measure? All right, let's, let's talk through each one of those individually, see if we can rule anything out, but, but typically it ends up with being kind of a kitchen sink approach. There's kind of a story that you can tell to convince yourself that any one of these variables could potentially be important. So there's the possible confounders that we came up with and ended up adjusting for in our analysis. And you can head to the next slide. Okay, so the, the issues that we were addressing in this analysis, first is that is there's three level outcome right? it's not so simple as having sort of a binary outcome or a continuous outcome it sort of fell in between right so there's active tb latent tb uh, and individuals who are not affected with tb uh, we already sort of mentioned there's a lot of unknown biology uh, at this problem and in particular there was questions my collaborators had about sort of what should we do with the other worms that individuals are infected with should we treat those one by one or should we lump them all together, kind of cumulative number of worms, a worm burden kind of variable. There are some un uncertainties there. Okay, and the third issue was that the fact that we're really addressing an effect modification question. That was kind of of primary interest. So what are we thinking about in terms of how that should influence our, our modeling decisions? Okay, so we can head to the next slide. So the first question was, how do we do the super learning for the three level outcome? Um, right, so we, came up with sort of an inelegant solution. Uh, this, this analysis was implemented by actually by an immunology PhD student. Who, so it was pretty impressive that somebody with very little math background was able to pull this off, but it meant sort of cutting corners at places to come up with sort of practical solutions to problems. And this was one of them, right? So rather than sort of fitting one super learner uh, for a, uh, to estimate the whole kind of distribution of tuberculosis infectants, active, latent, healthy, we ended up fitting two super learners, right? And the first one was sort of modeling the probability of having active disease as a function of your schisto infection status and covariates. And the second was uh, probability of having latent disease given that you don't have active disease and schisto in your covariates. And you can sort of just use rules of additional probability to uh, walk your way between those. And, and so we won't go through the math in, in detail there. Uh, but I'll just note that, that there are new super learner packages emerging that have much more elegant solutions to this. You can kind of handle this all in one super learner model. Uh, and I think that's great progress. 
All right, so let's go to the next slide. Okay, so this question of how to model the other worms, right? So really this is where Superlearner sort of shines, is you can just tell your collaborator, well, we don't have to pick just one model, right? We don't have to understand if it's a linear relationship or a threshold relationship, or whether we should include each worm separately or interactions between the worms and so forth. We just throw them all in the mix, right? And so that was our solution here is just to include several different modeling approaches for those worm variables. So we included adjusting for the total number of, of worms, sort of worm burden variable, uh, each worm separately, and then as well as modeling those using linear terms uh, versus spline. So we ended up sort of adding all combinations of those into the library, uh, adding four algorithms. In that way. All right, next slide. Okay, and then again, the question here is really an effect modification question. We were asking, does HIV sort of modify this association between schisto uh, and tuberculosis outcomes? And so just to, to highlight, when, when you're doing that, right, we need to make sure that at least some algorithms in your library are explicitly modeling interactions, right? If you only include, say, logistic regressions with main terms, right, your targeted learning analysis is never going to uncover an interaction. It'll never have a chance to. Right, so we need to make sure that the algorithms that we're including are doing some kind of explicit interaction modeling. Maybe, maybe that's obvious to everybody, but just, just to kind of hammer home that point, here's a few sort of options for doing that. So there's, of course, regression trees, uh, random forest, uh, boosting, and then we also included a logistic, kind of main term logistic regression models, but where we stratified those models based on HIV status. So fit one model in HIV negative individuals, one model in HIV positive individuals, and that was our sort of um, candidate algorithm. And we also included this sort of lasso that included all different two-way interactions. So you imagine that got quite high dimensional so that there was a need to sort of add that penalization uh, to that regression. So the, the takeaway there is just, if you're going after an interaction question, make sure your superliner library addresses that. Okay, next slide. So here are the results and we'll just sort of walk through them. Briefly, so on the left side here is uh, HIV, HIV negative individuals. The right side is HIV positive individuals. And then the bars are showing the distribution of the, the TB outcomes. So the, um, the bottom bar, uh, in each case, the reddish bars, that's, uh, that's active TB. The bluish bars, that's latent TB, and green is healthy. Um, and so what we found is that in HIV negative individuals, right, there wasn't strong evidence of an association between schisto uh, and TB, but in HIV positive individuals, there was a much higher probability uh, of having active disease, really, and not much impact on the probability of having latent disease. Uh, and that interaction between HIV positive and negative is the association of schisto the same with TB between those groups uh, ended up being quite, uh, providing quite strong evidence that that interaction was real. All right, next slide. Here's the sort of what the super learners look like in that case. We won't spend too much time on it, just, just to sort of show you what we ended up having in there. So we had all of those logistic regression models that had the different combinations of the worm variables, right? Total worms, each worms, and then modeling those with splines. Uh, we had forward stepwise regressions. We had cart. We had random forest with different tuning parameters. We had that lasso with two-way interactions. Uh, we had boosted trees. Uh, polymars and then a very simple model and you can sort of see between the two different models superlearner kind of put weight all over the place uh, but that's okay we can go to the next slide uh, here's the um the model for the propensity score right so here the, the exposure was schistosomiasis infection and really there is basically no signal at all for <laughs> predicting schisto infection from the available variables you can see that the, the intercept only model does about as well as any of the other models can go to the next slide. The student actually implemented sort of the, the cross-validated super learner, so a cross-validated um, evaluation of the performance of the super learner. And so you can see it here for those two models, active TB versus latent TB. You see super learner coming in near the top there, a lot of algorithms performing fairly similarly well, uh, random forest and polymars near the top, uh, and then that lasso including two-way interactions near the top for latent variables or for latent TB, excuse me. All right, and next slide. And here's the, the same story for the, the exposure model, where here you really see that there's no signal at all. The winners here are the intercept only model, the cart, which is that R part prune that's at the top there, uh, 
And that's really because the, the regression tree decided not to split at all. <laughs> so it really is just an intercept only model. And so really not a lot of signal at the end of the day in the, in the propensity score model. All right, next slide. Okay, so again, if you care about interactions, make sure you're modeling interactions, pretty, pretty obvious, but just to drive that point home. And then this is sort of my opinion, just adding, adding on here, you know, I, I would say that in general, if you were to make a choice of adding one more learner to your library, I think you're going to get more bang for your buck by going for a more diverse learner as opposed to a learner that looks like one that you already have in your library, but that makes a slightly different modeling decision, right? So if you're kind of constrained computationally and trying to decide between maybe do I add in this whole new class of learner or do I just sort of tweak an existing learner, I think you're going to do better by trying to diversify the set of learners in your library. That said, there's something kind of comforting in the ability of, of including these many different versions of the model. It kind of gives you peace of mind to know that you didn't miss sort of the way that we modeled worm burden, right? Didn't have this huge adverse impact on our outcome. And oh, if we had only included total worms instead of the worms individually, our results would have looked so much different. So there is some sort of peace of mind to that. Uh, and so all of this is kind of moot if you have the patience to include 100 learners in your library and let the analysis run. Uh, but in practice, right, we're kind of faced with the realities that, you know, our, my, my student is running this on her laptop and she needs her laptop to do other homework assignments, right? So there's sort of a limited number of, uh, of computing time that she's going to be able to, to devote to this project. So that's sort of just a, some rough ideas of, of sort of deciding between in a computationally constrained environment how to pick these different learners. Uh, the final point here is that a little calculus can go a long way. So here we were in a situation where um, actually we needed multiple super learner models. We needed multiple TMLEs to address this kind of three level outcome to come up with that result table that we showed. And really, if you sort of understand calculus of influence functions and you understand the delta method, that's a sort of trivial uh, computation to do. So again, this was an immunology PhD student who was able to pull this off. So thinking about where to invest in, in understanding the theory of this stuff, I think sort of understanding uh, the notion of asymptotic linearity and the notion of, of delta method calculus really can take you a very long way in sort of addressing these kind of minor tweaks on existing software. So you can still leverage existing software, but you have to do a bit of, use a bit of elbow grease on the back end, but really you can go a long way with just a little bit of know-how. All right, so we'll keep moving. All right, so here's my final additional thoughts on how to choose algorithms. Um, everybody asks when I give a talk like this, what are the best algorithms? And it's sort of just this, this blanket question. And I like to remind them that of course, there's no universal best algorithm, uh, but the things that I like to try to include, uh, you know, that, that I've seen in diverse settings still do a pretty good job. Of course, a random forest, so the Ranger package provides a fast implementation of that. Uh, Polymars is actually a great, I think, often overlooked algorithm. So the Earth package has a nice, fast implementation of that. And then very often boosting does a good job. Uh, and the XG boost package is reasonably fast. But in addition to that, I, I like to remind people not to sort of give up on the classics. Right? So sitting down with your collaborators and cooking up the best logistic regression, best linear regression you can, I think it stands a pretty good chance of being competitive, even with these uh, very computationally intensive, aggressive algorithms. Okay, the final point here is that some algorithms can be great, uh, but maybe require a lot of tuning to be to, to perform well, um, right? So I'm, I'm looking at deep learning here, right? Is like you can make deep learning work for just about any problem, but it might take you half a year to identify the right tuning parameters that give you reasonable performance. And in the context of something like super learning, right, where you need to not just implement that algorithm once, but potentially 10 or 20 times, uh, that's really a limitation. So I think things like deep learning and at sometimes boosting, things that have a lot of knobs to turn, I think can be great and you can get them to work really well. Uh, but in the context of super learning are often maybe not worth the effort. Okay, so we'll sort of blow through the last two sections here. That's okay. Uh, so just a note on reproducibility. So here's an email I received from this, this graduate student two weeks prior to her defense when she was preparing the Schisto analysis. 
she said I had to update R in R Studio for this R workshop, and my advisor asked me to rerun the analysis because we wanted to remove a couple people whose results ended up looking a little questionable in the lab. And so when I reran the analysis, I got all these error messages and weird warnings, and the analysis wouldn't run. And now I'm panicking and freaking out because I have to defend this analysis in, in two weeks' time. So we go to the next slide. Just to note that sort of as we move towards these more complex analyses, there's kind of a host of issues that can arise, right, in terms of uh, having minor changes to R, or versioning, or R packages leading to errors or different results, right? And you're not gonna go through the change log of the XG boost package to figure out what the, the maintainer changed to lead to these different results, right? So what can we do to sort of ensure that we can end up with a reproducible analysis uh, irrespective of, of what might change an R on a day-to-day -day basis? So I've been moving more towards these, the idea of using containers and containerization to try to ensure that full reproducibility. So if you go to the next slide, I'll just say a few words about that. So Docker, there's, many, there's, there's several programs available for doing these kind of container-based applications. So Docker is probably the, the most popular one. It's a free program uh, and it, it allows you to build so-called containers. So what containers are are really like tiny little computers. They're just packages of all code and all dependencies. They have their own operating system their own version of R and all the R packages that you need. And all of that lives in this container, okay? And so you can send somebody that container, have them download it from the internet and they can run it on their computer and it's gonna behave the same as if you run it on your computer or somebody runs it in the cloud. And the idea here is that when we're coding analyses is we're often thinking that the code I'm writing is limited to right, the way that I'm analyzing the data. But that's not true, right? The software that's running that code, right? That's code itself, software is code. Right? And so if we really want all levels of reproducibility to hold, we need to kind of lock in place that software as well. And that's what these containers really allow you to do. Go to the next slide. Here's just a silly PowerPoint that I put together. Again, it doesn't matter what OS you're on, right? Somebody can run this on an Apple computer, somebody can run it on Windows, somebody can run it in the cloud, and you're gonna end up with exactly the same results every time. It's a pretty neat idea. The next slide. So here's an example of this where we've been working on using super learning in this kind of reproducible pipeline. You can see kind of what the call to Docker looks like there. Um, it's just a few lines executed at the command line and we have it set up so that it does this whole super learning analysis. It generates this report uh, and that report is fully reproducible, right? Anybody can pull this down anywhere in the world, uh, run the analysis and get exactly the same results. So if you wanna look at that on the next slide, I have sort of the source code or what that looks like, the documentation, and where you can download that. All right, next slide. Okay, so the very last thing I wanna talk about um, is the idea of trying to stabilize inference here. So this is something that was recently brought to my attention. I hadn't spent too much time thinking about it before, but it was sort of startling uh, realization to come to. So the idea here is that because super learning is relying on splitting the data random, right? There's, there's sort of a random component to the analysis. All right, so the results can change if different seeds are set. Okay, so that's why I said, and before I had a big bold point, right? Always set a seed before the analysis. That's, that's very good practice, right? Um, and if you do that, this will never be an issue for you, uh, but you kind of have to live with the fact that maybe if you had set a different seed, your results could have looked quite different. So I wanna talk about what can we do to address that issue. So this is really a small sample issue, right? In large samples, things are gonna be pretty ch stable, right? Changes are gonna be negligible. The algorithms start to settle down. It doesn't matter, you know, if you have 10,000 observations, it doesn't matter which 8,000 of them you use to fit an algorithm, the algorithm looks about the same. But in small samples, things can look quite different. So here's a sort of very simple simulation uh, of this kind of point treatment problem where you have uh, four binary confounders, you have logistic regression, uh, describing the treatment probability, logistic regression, describing the outcome. And if you go to the next slide, what we did here was basically do a very basic kind of targeted learning analysis. We put a, a super learner for the outcome, put a super learner for the propensity score. Uh, and we did this on one data set, a data set of size 200. Uh, but then we did this repeatedly on that same data set. We set a different seed and fit the super learner and did the TMLE. And we did this for a thousand different seeds. If you go to the next slide, you can sort of see how things change. So this is one data set analyzed with the same approach, 
The only thing that's different is how the data were split up in the super learning uh, cross validation, right? So depending on the seed, you can see this is a, what I'm showing here is the distribution of the p value for the test that that treatment effect is zero, right? And what you can see is was sort of alarming to me is that depending on the seed that you set, you could end up with very strong evidence of a treatment effect uh, with a very small p value out to the third decimal place or almost no evidence of a treatment effect, right? With a p value close to one. Okay, so good next slide. So our proposed solution to this, this was a master's uh, student thesis this year. It's a, it's a pretty common uh, idea in the machine learning, right? Is that you're just gonna average the results over multiple seeds, right? So we're gonna run this procedure, not just once, we're gonna run it many times uh, to try to stabilize the behavior. All right, so the questions the student was addressing in her thesis were how, do, how should we perform this averaging? There's sort of two scales you can think about averaging on. You could fit multiple super learners and then average the fits from those super learners and throw that into TML, TMLE. Or you could fit a super learner, throw that into TMLE, get your answer, do that many times and average on the scale of your point estimates. So the question was which one of those, both, both can be justified theoretically, which one is better in practice? Right. And the second obvious question is, how many seeds do I need? Right. How 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 many seeds do I need before uh, my inference settles down? And how does that depend on sample size? We can go to the next slide. Okay. So we designed a simulation here, um, and maybe we can just go to the results, and I'll sort of walk. So that's the next slide. So I'll sort of walk you through this this figure. Uh, one, one back. Yeah, that's great. Okay. So what I'm showing here, each point in this uh, plot is a data set. And for each data set, we analyze it using 150 different seeds. And what we're showing in the plot on the horizontal axis is the proportion of analyses over those 150 different seeds where we rejected the null hypothesis of no treatment effect. So what we'd like to see here, ideally, if, uh, if our inference is robust to the seed that we set, we should like that over those 150 analyses, we either always reject the null hypothesis or we don't reject the null hypothesis, right? The worst case thing we could see here, right, is that in half, half the seeds we set, we reject, and half the seeds we set, we don't reject, right? Because that would say our inference is basically a coin flip, depending on which seed you set, you could go one way or the other. Okay, so what we'd really like to see is, is dots piling up uh, at the extremes of the horizontal axis here, either always rejecting the null or never rejecting the null. We'd like to see that for many different data sets as well. And so then moving up in a given panel, we're, we're looking at the, uh, the number of replicates. So one time is your, your standard, you set one seed, you run your analysis one time, and then five times as you run your analysis, five times and average the results and so forth, all the way up to 80 times. And so the left panel here is averaging on the scale of the point estimates, um, TMLE, and the right side is averaging on the scale of the super learner. So a couple of takeaways from this, as you see, at sample size 100, things are sort of a mess, right? It, if you're only doing this one time, you're getting sort of very unstable inference. Um, as the sample size increases, of course, as I mentioned, things start to settle down. And in, in just doing one time, you're often ending up with analyses that don't depend on uh, the random seed that you set. Uh, it looks like averaging on the scale of TMLE is stabilizing faster than on the super learner scale, right? So fewer replicates are required. And then when we looked at the actual point estimates in terms of their bias and their standard deviation and confidence interval coverage, there was really a lot of similarity, not much difference between the two scales for averaging. So uh, it seems we're recommending averaging on the scales of TMLE. All right, so we can go to the next slide. Uh, just to point out, so this was very alarming to me. Um, and I immediately took it to my colleague with the TB data and said, oh my gosh, we need to make sure that inference isn't heavily dependent on seed, right? Because that was a, an N equals 100 analysis. So I was very stressed out. Uh, but we took, when we took it to him and reanalyzed the data, what we found is that we really didn't see this instability, at least in that, in that data set. And, and we can really kind of understand that by the fact that if we remember the super learner was putting almost all its weight on that logistic regression, right? And that logistic regression really isn't going to be changing much depending on the seed that's set. Right, so uh, you end up with actually something that looks pretty stable, right? Whereas in the simulation, what the super learner is doing is putting a lot of weight on random forest, right? So it is moving around a lot depending on which seed is set. So this isn't behavior that you can always expect to see, but it is something to be aware of, I think, going forward with this type of analysis. Right, next slide. I think we're pretty close. Okay, so here's my takeaways from that. Always pre-specify a seed 
right? And if you're locking an analysis plan in place and you don't want to do this averaging, then you need to, to, to say upfront what that seed's going to be, right? We don't want to be accused of kind of p-hacking our way uh, by finding a seed that gives us the answer that we like. Again, this averaging is not always going to make a difference, but in some situations it can. Uh, and the rule of thumb based on our initial simulations of it, between 20 and, and 40 uh, repeated super learners seems to be good enough for small samples and about five or 10 in large samples. All right, next slide. Just acknowledgements here, a few great students who are starred there, uh, Yuan Zhao, Taryn McLaughlin, and Weishin Song, and my other collaborators on all the projects that I mentioned. And I'll just finish by thanking Susan again for this opportunity and encouraging if anyone has questions or uh, any follow-up, you can reach out to me via email. It's just my last name, Ben Kesser at emory.edu. And I hope everybody stays safe and healthy uh, and sane in the, the kind of insane world that we're living in at the moment. So thanks.